Angelica Henderson, and this is on background. How much is too much to know about your own DNA? Until recently, the startup 23andMe charged 99 bucks to test customers' saliva, then send them their raw genetic information, ancestry composition, and most troubling, at least to the FDA, an analysis of their risk for hundreds of various diseases. A scathing letter from the FDA suggested the test might constitute unsafe medical guidance and prompted 23andMe to halt the analyses in November. Outrage ensued from customers who found the test enlightening and despite concerns from some medical professionals, it seems only a matter of time perhaps before 23andMe gets the necessary government approvals or another company does first. Here to shed some light on all this is Robert Klitzman. He's the director of the Masters of Bioethics program at Columbia University. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Klitzman, for, for joining me today. I, I want to first start out and say we reached out to 23andMe uh, to get their comment and input, and, and they didn't offer any comment to us today. So I want to just start off with you and, and talk about how this actually works. What do I would, I guess, swab, get some saliva, put it in the mail? What am I getting in return? Right. So the, the human genome, the DNA that makes each of us, that makes you, you, and me, me, and that uh, determines the color of our hair, the color of our eyes, and what diseases we might be exposed to, consists of three billion letters, three billion molecules that are one of four molecules, and we assign a letter to each. Uh, so there are these three billion molecules that we can now look at. Okay. What 23andMe does, it looks at every, at a, one out of every 3,000 of these and says, uh, here are about a million of these little snips or little pieces, uh, and that's going to tell us something about your genetics. Uh, and if for some people, a few people, it can say something, but for the vast majority of people, it does not give medically useful information, and that's why the FDA said they had to stop. Okay, so they have, I mean, they have a pretty so sophisticated website here and, and PR arm. Uh, they have an advertisement featuring a, a woman who got this test done. She was having stomach problems and found out that she had a very specific uh, disorder. We're going to play this clip here from this woman. When I was in my 20s, I started noticing that I was having problems with anemia. A couple years after that, I noticed that I was having just stomach problems. I've suffered for 15 years with, with stomach problems that I just thought was just going to be my normal. When I got my results back, the biggest red flag was for celiac disease, something that I'd never even heard of. And thankfully, the 23andMe website had a link, so I clicked on celiac disease and it described it. And I said, oh my gosh, is that what I've had this whole time and didn't even know it? So there is a kind of success story, right, from this company, 23andMe, and this ad, which we showed about 20 seconds of, it's about three minutes, and it does feature a doctor, and she says after she got this test, she consults with her doctor, and then the doctor does a blood test based on this information uh, that she's gotten from 23andMe. What's your response to that? Well, so as I said, for a few people, a small, tiny percent of people who undergo testing through 23andMe, they may get information that may be useful, right. but the majority do not. So for her case, for instance, based on the, the ad, celiac disease, the genes she has are genes that 40%, 35 or 40% of Americans have. Okay. And of those who have the gene, only 1% to 4% actually have the disease, will ever get the disease. So if you take 1,000 people who undergo testing for 23andMe, 400, 350 to 400 people are going to be told, guess what, you have this gene means you might have celiac disease. Okay. Okay. Those who get tested, really only 8 or 10 people are going to end up having it. So you have 300 and, you know, 90 people are going to be told you have this increased risk of celiac disease, and it's meaningless. It doesn't mean they have increased rates of celiac disease. They are perfectly fine. They'll never get the disease. Right. right. Uh, so you have a lot of people who may get very anxious and depressed, and I would argue a good clinician should listen to a patient's story and hear, oh, my God, maybe it's celiac disease. And, rather than relying on a test that in 98 95% of people is not going to indicate disease even when it's positive. And this celiac disease, I mean, not to, to get too in the weeds about this specific disease, but uh, according to this ad, and I think according uh, to science and medicine too, 
you would get a blood test and you would see if you actually had celiac disease. It seems to me that any good doctor, you go and you complain about a stomach ache over and over again, the doctor would say, hey, well, let me run some blood tests. Right, exactly right. That's yeah. right. And, but of course, what they're doing is they're not saying, here's a thousand people who got no information. They're taking right. the one person. And, and again, I should say, for a few people, a handful of people, there may be useful information. But for the vast majority, there aren't. And the problem is 23andMe is trying to get customers saying, give us 99 bucks and we'll give you medically useful information. Right, and, and there were certain, yes, medical information that you would then perhaps act on, and that is the FDA's, one of their primary concerns here. Uh, and this is what they had to say, and in what was a really sort of scathing warning letter to 23andMe, uh, they said some of the uses uh, for which the personal genome service is intended are particularly concerning. If the BRCA related risk assessment for breast or ovarian cancer reports a false positive, it could lead a patient to undergo prophylactic surgery, chemo prevention, intensive screening, or other morbidity inducing actions. This BRCA gene, same thing that Angelina Jolie had, famously wrote an op-ed in the New York Times and of course got a double mastectomy as well. Yes, that's exactly right. So that's a problem is that, uh, and I should say, the FDA, what the FDA did is they worked with 23andMe over several years. They had hundreds of phone calls, 14 meetings. They said, just show us the data. Show us evidence that what you're saying is correct. And FDA said, oh, we will, we will, don't worry. Yeah, we're working on it, we're working on it. And after several years and hundreds of phone calls and emails, they never did. And the FDA finally said, look, we've given you a chance to show us either evidence for what you're saying that it's valid or you have to stop saying it. Right. Uh, but yes, the problem is people could freak out. People could uh, be told, you know, they have an increased rate of Alzheimer's disease or they'll have breast cancer. They may take action or they may be told, well, you don't have that gene, so you don't have to worry about it. And people may not screen themselves for breast cancer and end up getting it. So one has to be very careful with medical information that it's given through a professional in an appropriate way because it has lots of meaning and implications for people. And the company responded, Ann uh, Wojcicki, she had this to say in terms of the FDA, what the FDA is sort of criticizing them for and looking for in terms of additional information. Here's what she had to say. What's always been the challenge with the FDA is it's the first time that we've really introduced a broad genome-wide test. We said originally, you know, we're kind of a square peg in a round hole. Do we fit in this existing system? Um, and we agreed um, that we were going to submit some 510Ks, which is sort of the, the medical device process, and we submitted those, and we are in the process of doing additional tests that they wanted us to do, and we will resubmit. She says there, uh, essentially she sort of frames it as uh, this is a matter of paperwork and submitting additional information that the FDA works. What's your assessment of her assessment of sort of the next steps? I mean, she sort of frames it as being inevitable, that this will happen. Well, well so she's been saying for several years, or the, the company's been saying for several years, we're working on it, we have tests in the process, and they've never produced any. So the FDA said for several years, okay, you're, I know you're working on it, you're going to get us something soon, and it hasn't happened. And after several years, uh, the FDA finally said, look, it's been several years, you haven't produced it. It's one thing to keep saying, we're going to do it, we're in the process, we're in the process, which she again just said there. So I think that's the problem, is at a certain point you have, uh, and I should say part of the reason some critics say she's been delaying is 23andMe's real goal was to get a million people to give their DNA. Uh, they already have several hundred thousand people's DNA. And with that, if their goal, in fact, is really just to get lots of people's DNA, uh, the reason they want that is because with that kind of information, they can make discoveries and patent things. And so if, you have, if I have a million people's DNA, I can make discoveries, I can patent things that I find, and I can make lots of money through that. So the real goal here is not to offer perhaps beneficial medical information, but to get people's DNA in terms of the real goal financially is not the $99 per test, but the millions that could be made uh, potentially if one discovers and patents certain things in the genome. So it, there are critics out there who've suggested that may be why she's been delaying. Again, uh, again, I've not spoken to her. Right, but, yeah, uh, and, and again, we reached out to 23 and, and me, and, and they didn't want to make any comment in terms of uh, the business at this point. Um, what is your 
um, response to this idea that I am my genes and my genetic information and my DNA, shouldn't I have the right to that information? Why do right. I have to, you know, sort of have, have it mediated through a medical professional such as yourself? Why can't I just get it? Right. And of course, the book that I published last year is right. called Am I My Genes? Confronting Fate and Family Secrets in the Age of Genetic Testing. Uh, yes, we have right to our information. However, if I say that I'm going to be giving you medically useful information and I know that it's not medically useful, that's false advertising. If you were to go to a doctor and the doctor said, I'm going to give you medically useful information, even though I know it's not useful for most people, uh, you, that would not be acceptable from a doctor. So if 23andMe were to say, you know, we're going to give you lots of information. For most people, most of it's not going to be useful, but here it is. And if you want it, sure, you have a right to it. Right. You know, your DNA is this. We don't know what it means. Here it is. Good luck with it. That's fine. But if they say uh, it's medically useful, they're making claims about it. And as I said, just as we wouldn't want to go to a doctor who said, uh, I'm, I'm giving you useful information when he or she knows it isn't, uh, it's not acceptable for a company to give medical information like that to people when uh, they don't have the data s to substantiate their claims that it's useful. And so what's your sense? Of, you can get over-the-counter HIV tests, right? Yes. What's the difference between what 23andMe is aiming to do and the fact that I, I can have access to my you know, HIV status very easily with an at-home test? I think on the box it says, please consult your doctor. Uh, what's the, the difference there? Right. The difference is that if a thousand people get HIV tests, they will all be given medically useful information, va medically valid information that either have HIV or they don't. If a thousand people go to uh, uh, get testing from 23andMe, the vast majority, 900 plus plus plus, are not going to be getting medically useful information. And I should say part is because it's hard to predict the future. It's hard right. to predict how our genes are going to lead to health. We can barely predict the weather in 24 hours from now. The weather report will say 30% chance of rain tomorrow and 30% chance of rain three days from now. Right. And genetics is trying to say these are diseases that you're going to have 30 years from now. Well, not surprisingly, it's hard to make those kinds of claims. What, I want you to put on your anthropology hat there. You're at Columbia University. That's the school that essentially has founded cultural anthropology. What does it say about us that we are interested in this information and then we want to act on it? Yes. Well, you know, throughout history, there have been beliefs that we can foresee the future. There have been fortune tellers palm readers, crystal balls. The ancient Greeks went to oracles that would predict the future. Lots of newspapers still run horoscopes every day. We all know whether we're a Cancer or Aquarius and people read, this means you're going to fall in love today or this means, you know, make a good, you know, whatever decision in business you make today, it will be good. So it's a great desire to understand the future and I think this taps into that and uh, as you mentioned, we, we teach courses in uh, online and in person here in bioethics in which we look at these issues from a cultural perspective and it's important as you say to understand how much it says something about us as a society and about our culture and the fact that we have certain desires to know the future and unfortunately genetics seems to promise that and right. for few people it does but for most of it at this point it doesn't. One of the ways you talk about looking into the future, one of the ways that 23andMe is also being, and the only way in some ways it's being used now is to look into the past for this ancestry information. And this is from 23andMe, a kind of ad talking about the ways that people can sort of connect with who they are uh, and who they're related to. Here's the ad. I had no way to ever try to find Greta. I didn't even know where she was born, what year she was born. I didn't know anything. We have a cousin, Laura, who has been looking for her birth father for 30 years. And she apparently had run across this DNA database website called 23andMe. The next thing I know, I get an email from Laura Oliver, and um, she said that you have a living sister. So you gotta admit, that's kinda cool, right? You can find your long lost sister. I hope, if I have one, I hope she's rich. Okay, there you go, yeah. me too. Yeah. <laughs> So, and that might be how this all ends up. That I mean, people at least find it useful in that way, and that 
you know, if not for medical information, that'll be the way that this uh, sort of genetic information is used. Well, I would just caution a few things. So there's two kinds of ancestry information. One is to say that you know, there's a 35% chance you come from West Africa, or right. 50% chance you come from Northern Europe. And most people sort of know that already about themselves. They may not know exactly what percent, but they know there's a relative somewhere back from wherever we came from Ireland or we're Jewish or Russian or whatever. Uh, the other thing that, that that ad says is you could find a long lost relative, my, my first cousin or my sister. So what that depends on is that that person somewhere in the world has also entered 23andMe. Right, yes. And so if 23andMe now has, if all these different companies that have done direct-to-consumer marketing of tests, genetic tests, if they now, let's say, have half a million people. So basically one out of every 600 people, which means that if 600 people in the United States, 599 have not had it. So of 600 people, if your long-lost relative is one of the 599, you're out of luck. Right. If your long-lost relative is the one right out of the 600, then you may be in luck. Uh, so again, it, uh, uh, you could interview the one person who found, or you know, so out of, you know, uh, the, you know let's say you have 10,000 people, so yeah. it's going to be, you know, however many people that is, uh, you know, one out of every 600. So there'll be 60 people out of, and, you know, 900, 9,000 who right. were not part yeah, of it. And if you're relevant, one right. of them, you'll get it. Very unlikely that you're going to find your long lost right, sister, yes, uh, Dr. Klitzman, uh, using this service. Of Columbia University, Am I My Genes is your book. Uh, thank you, sir, for joining me today and shedding light on uh, this, this technology. You're Take welcome. Good, care. good luck. That's it for us today. Thanks again to Robert Clipson for joining us. Now our Twitter question of the day. If and when 23andMe gets approvals for those risk analyses, do you plan to get that test done? Tweet us your answers to at background and use that hashtag postback. And we'll see you right back here tomorrow.